that uh, New Delhi is very sort of um, uh, horizontally spread out uh, or historically has been, it's starting to grow more vertical. Uh, but uh, I think Mumbai, of course, enjoys the fact that you've got a lot of sea breeze moving in and out of the city, creating ventilation for the city per se. So you can have uh, vertical structures. Delhi doesn't enjoy that. So you have to, I think, generally speaking, decide as a city, uh, you know, what model you want to take based on, you know, your own climatic conditions. So that's it. Coming, coming from Hong Kong, what do you think? Yes, uh, Hong Kong is very much like uh, Mumbai in that sense. So Hong Kong is at the, the same uh, sort of latitude as New Delhi. <laughs> But yeah, it enjoys so uh, oh, the sea breeze, yeah. like uh, uh, like Mumbai. Amazing, amazing! You talk about Hong Kong. Um, uh, I actually stay in Hong Kong. Sorry. Oh, amazing, amazing! I didn't because, introduce uh, myself like that. Yeah. Okay, amazing because uh, it's hilly. Yes. Small town. Okay, let me call it small city. <laughs> No traffic yes. jam. No traffic jams. I, yes. And I think it has made provisions for the blind. The uh, those people yes. who are enabled differently. Yes. And of course, yes. the tram cut in very well. And uh, if you can uh, enjoy a cruise around the the island, I think it's something that's very, very, very extremely amazing. We were there for about two, three days, and. Uh, can't just forget the experience. I tend to agree with you. I think the, the way the infrastructure is, uh, I mean, Hong Kong is blessed in the sense that it's at a very nice latitude. Uh, it's got a very beautiful uh, topography as well. Like, you know, you've got the sea, you've got the, uh, the peak. Uh, it's not like flat like Singapore. It's, uh, you know, you can have uh, a good uh, sort of, you can within say about, 10 or 15 kilometers of anywhere, you can enjoy a mountain trail and you can sort of uh, go to the beach as well, which is amazing. Uh, the infrastructure, I think the, a lot of the credit for the um, infrastructure planning, I would say, goes to the British. They sort of laid it out really nicely, a, ni a very nice roadmap. Uh, and I tend to agree with you in terms of uh, providing, uh, you know, uh, soft facilities for people with uh, uh, some impairments. For example, you know, if you need wheelchair access or if, you know, people who have visual impairments, things like that, Hong Kong does. Um, um, the building uh, rules actually provide for each and every building to be friendly towards uh, people with impairments which is great, really. Uh, it's something that I've not seen very much, uh, uh, you know, in incorporated into the planning around the world. Hong Kong does that really well. The only challenge, it's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. <laughs> <laughs> so you must be very highly paid, man. Or are you in business? Um, uh, I, I'm just... I'm just lucky I'm not very highly paid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Or at least not, uh, not uh, you know, uh, considering what people get paid in Hong Kong uh, is... Speaker for this week, Major General Dr. Ravendra Chaturvedi. He is an anesthesiologist and uh, an astute administrator, 40 years ago and administrative experience running the armed forces and civilian medical services. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ravindra, and we are very happy to have you, and I'm sure there is so much that we can learn from your wide experience in the medical field. Thank you, Ritesh. And uh, also, Rashmi, you do have some more guests who have logged on today. Kindly, kindly do let us know. Yes, I have actually, I think I'll just mention them that uh, a lot of friends are joining in today. Uh, also to hear uh, Dr. Ravi and uh, I have invited them and when they log in, I think you can just say a word to them. Vikram is there from Hong Kong, Upendra is there from New Delhi and others are also joining in. Thank you. Um, a very warm welcome to all the guests and we are grateful for your attendance. Thank you so much.
And uh, with that, um, uh, I'd like uh, to call upon uh, our past president, Dr. David Gitanga, who's uh, a leading uh, uh, pediatric uh, doctor and uh, also uh, chairman of Nairobi Hospital to kindly introduce our guest speaker for today. So Dr. Gitanga. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ritesh. Uh, I don't know if they can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, I thought Rashmi had already introduced our guest today, uh, uh, but I will uh, probably just give a bit of a background uh, since I have the resume. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dev Gidanga. I am a pediatrician and uh, I also have a little bit of interest in uh, public health. And obviously this is a very interesting subject. But to introduce our guest, allow me to call you Dr. Ravi, <laughs> it's easier I guess, uh, is a renowned uh, anesthetist as we would call them here, Americans tend to say, and it's a sociologist and people find that long, and has been uh, an administrator for a long period of time and I'm sure his association with the armed forces has complemented his abilities at being a good administrator in a medical setup, which is a complex affair. He's an alumnus of the more, uh, modern school in Delhi, where he studied medicine uh, at the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune. He then specialized further in anesthesia and super specialized in critical care, as well as uh, giving anesthesia to children at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. As a major general in the army, uh, uh, he served the whole of entire South India, including a fairly successful oversight of the medical and preventive health of the affected populations, especially during the 2015 disastrous floods in Chennai. He's been dean at the Army College of Medical Sciences in Delhi, uh, in command hospital in, uh, in Bangalore, professor and head of uh, AFMC, uh, Pune and Professor of Organ Transplant Anesthesia at the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences in India. He's one of the larger areas for liver diseases. He's an academician in his own right. He's published and researched and uh, for a long period of time. He was a president of Indian Society of Anesthetists in Delhi and also an editor of uh, an important journal of medical academics. He's widely published, he's given many lectures and so on. And his current areas of interest are critical care, transplant anesthesia, as well as promoting excellence in medical academics. And that's a very important issue. I'll just make a few comments because I'm also in another meeting. Uh, I may not be able to hang on. But just to remind us, those of us that are not doctors, oh, Barbara, you can ignore this. Uh, uh, Dr. Rav, you can ignore this. When you see a patient, you go through certain processes to make a diagnosis or to get them treated. The first thing you do is to take a history, right? History uh, is commonly taught to medical students, gives you 50% of the diagnosis. Of course, you must do a physical exam. Physical exam is meant to complement certain things, certain ideas that are already in your head or something you want to exclude. Oftentimes, you may need to do testing to exclude some things and or confirm others, not to mention the things that you're not exactly able to assess, but just, uh, 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 but just looking or just palpating or auscultating. So those are the processes that we go through uh, uh, in, uh, uh, when you see a patient. But obviously, you all know, since many of you have been to see doctors, that before you reach the doctor to go through those processes, you'll have to have gone through process of getting your records retrieved, how are you paying and so on. A lot of routine work that takes an awful lot of time. Woe to you if you have to pay for tests, things that are routine again, you take an awful lot of time. And this is where uh, uh, I think Dr. Ravi's uh, conversation will be probably taking us, and I'm not trying to preempt his talk, Basically, what are the areas that uh, uh, artificial intelligence, which was the term that was coined in 56, uh, is meant to assist in, in development of medicine? 
a lot of you will have interacted with artificial intelligence in terms of record keeping, the electronic medical keeping and so on. Uh, maybe very few of you will have interacted with robotic surgery, and I'm sure uh, uh, that is something that you may be able to bring up, will we be able to bring up. And just to mention maybe a few things that people worry about <laughs> artificial intelligence in medicine. People, some people think they're going to lose jobs, but we also thought that when computers came to do accounts and so on, all these spreadsheets, I think people just recreate themselves, right? The other areas is really, uh, obviously, uh, equipment don't have a human touch and so on. And human touch, empathy, emotional intelligence is a very, very, very important uh, area. But the upside is even better. I talked about efficiency in record keeping, consistency, accuracy, and so on. And then reduction of that routine work, enabling the physician to spend time with, uh, with, with the patient. And you will know that uh, if your doctor doesn't spend time with you, you feel very irritated. In private practice, they say, he only wanted my money. So uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, with some of, taking over some, some of this routine work, you will, uh, we will be able to spend a bit more time with you. The downside of it also, I see this in private practice, is uh, people say, these young doctors are always reading all the time. <laughs> They're looking at stuff, things that really annoy you. I think things that relate to emotional intelligence. Without uh, saying a lot more, I'd like to welcome Ravi to uh, uh, take us through this. And I may be in and out, I'm in between two meetings and thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, also thank you for introducing my topic so succinctly. Uh, I will try to now share my screen before I start. Yes, is my screen visible? Yes, yes it is. So at the outset, I would like to thank the president of Rotary Club of Nairobi, Mr. Rakesh, uh, Mr. Ritesh Banot, and uh, Ms. Rashmi Chok. Thank you so much for inviting me to your uh, August gathering and giving me an opportunity to speak on a subject uh, that, is, uh, that has fascinated me for a lot many years now artificial intelligence in uh, medicine. In fact, artificial intelligence per se fascinates almost all of us. And we've all had our views and brushed with movies and imagination as to what that might be doing. Uh, Dr. David has already given a very brief overview. Uh, but since this audience, I believe, is quite varied with different backgrounds, I'd like to start with a little bit on artificial intelligence itself. So what I would like to do, uh, just a minute. How do I get uh, the viewing people from my, you know, main screen? Anybody, any idea? Okay, from here, I think I can minimize it. Yeah. So we'll be talking about the basic concept of machine learning, deep learning and AI as to what they mean. The growth of AI based applications in medicine then we'll talk about the challenges of AI-based medical applications, the future trends, and as Dr. David put it, will AI replace doctors? That is a question which many doctors have thought of and even others who are uh, engaged in producing new applications think that they might be able to replace doctors in due course. So talking about artificial intelligence, in layman's terms, Artificial intelligence is programming systems to perform tasks which usually require human intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence encompasses the machine learning and deep learning, which are the subsets of this. Machine learning, on the other hand, is training algorithms to solve tasks by pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is a key word over here, instead of specifically programming them how to solve the task. Now, uh, when we were in school and college, we knew that there was a programming language and we programmed whatever, whatever applications we had. There is a time now when you really don't need to program, and I'll talk about it as we move further. That is in the traditional sense. Deep learning, on the other hand, 
is learning from itself. It is training algorithms by using deep neural networks. And these neural uh, networks are quite akin to our uh, neural network in the brain with multiple layers. And here, as the, uh, the application is used, it continues to learn from fresh data. So artificial neural networks is a computer system model on human brain and nervous system. ANN is an interconnected group of nodes akin to vast network of neurons in the brain. And each circular node in the figure that you see here, that represents a node. So you have input over here at the nodes and you have output. And in between, you've got lots and lots. I've represented only with one. Lots and lots of nodes uh, which are hidden. And we really don't know how they function. So again, coming back to a simpler example, in machine learning, we have an input, say this figure over here. And there's a man who feeds it into the computer. And then through the neural network, it decides based on its features, because the feature extraction is done by the human interface over here. It decides whether it is a car or it is not a car. As against this in deep learning, you do away with this figure here. And you have an input, and then it does feature extraction on its own, classifies, and then tells you whether it is a car or it is not a car. So that brings us to the question that when machine tells you on its own whether it's a car or not, does it actually think and tell you, and how does it do it? Well, machines can think is something that we all have been uh, you know, kind of imagining. But frankly, machines don't really think. Turing, way back in 1950, knew that artificial intelligence would uh, come up in a big way in due course. He was hoping that it will come much faster, maybe in the 50s or 60s. And he predicted at that time that uh, by the year 2000, a man who is blinded would not be able to make out whether a response to his question or a response from another being is coming from a computer or from a human being. And at that time, everybody laughed at Turing because they thought that this uh, was preposterous, it's not going to happen. However, his prophecy came true. And in 2014, Eugene Gutzman, a chatbot, he, he showed a chatbot was portrayed as being a 13-year-old boy from Odessa, Ukraine. And when blinded judges were asked, you know, they asked questions and when the response from the chat bot, uh, they were asked to judge whether it was uh, from a human being or it was from a computer. And 33% of the human judges thought that Gutsman was a human. Now, as I told you, uh, the concept, a generation of AI came as early as 1956. And in 59, we had uh, the use of natural languages. Then there were early investments in the 60s in AI, and uh, the first ro smart robots were born in 1972. But at the, that time, the computing ability was rather low. And we only knew how to give directions to the computer and get results out of it. And so the expectations were high, and the results were not as good. The funds dried up, and so we had a trough of a disillusionment and the investments went away from here. In 85, with advancing computer systems, again, some interest was there. And in the 90s, actually, for the first time in 1997, uh, in the first uh, artificial intelligence to human race, the computer for the first time beat a grandmaster, Gary Kasparov, in the game of chess. At that time, it was considered really a very uh, big thing. And it was uh, covered very widely in the press. And that brought in more interest into developing AI, which could be used in various fields, not only medical. 2005 saw another major change, and that was generation of big data. I'll talk about what is big data. And then in 2016, suddenly there is an exponential growth. And almost everything we see today is having artificial intelligence. So a lot has changed since Turing's days. Firstly, is the growth in computation power. And here I'd like to tell you that on the left side of the screen, you see a small picture of a graphic processing unit from 2018. 
this gpu is uh, available or was available in every, with every other uh, teenager in 2018 in the us and the computing power of this was equivalent to the supercomputer of 2006 so you can imagine how much the computing power has increased and how minimized it has become now the other thing that has come up is availability of big data and that is thanks to google amazon and so many others because almost everything including this talk is on google so uh, a lot of data is being created every day and today we have uh, data at estimated at around 1200 petabytes or 1.2 million terabytes this is one hell of a lot i remember my first computer had about 4 mb of data and we used to use floppies of 4 mb and then there has been advances in machine learning and algorithms and these three together have brought in the revolution now i told you about the chess game Another very important landmark uh, in the artificial intelligence history has been the, the triumph of uh, artificial intelligence or the computers over man in the game of Go. Game of Go was invented more than 2005 years back. And the goal in this is to surround more territory. It is got 19 by 19 squares and white and black uh, points are used. So the game, the aim here is to surround more and more territories. It's a very challenging game because in computer there are in this game there are more than 10 raised to the power 170 moves possible. This is one huge number, especially considering the fact that in the observable universe we have only 80 raised to the power 81 atoms. So it's a very complex pattern based and hard to program game. So there is no programming that is possible. But Google's DeepMind uses artificial neural network and deep learning to program a system which would play with specialists. And here, uh, it was a landmark in 2016 when AlphaGo versus Lee Sedol. Lee Sedol was the second best player of uh, AlphaGo. And uh, when this game was played, uh, Lee Sedol lost, lost four is to one. Now, interestingly, while this game was being played, the computer was learning. So next day when it played with 60 professional players at the same time, this time it won 60 is to zero. And of course, another, uh, another grandmaster, KG, also lost three to zero. Now, this is not enough. Now, this computer which played these games was set aside. And AlphaGo Zero, a new program, was developed, which was uh, given access to all the games that had ever been played. And when this computer played with AlphaGo the next day, that is two computers playing against each other, the AlphaGo 0 won 100 to 0. Now this event is five years old and it is a landmark event because it could never be imagined that so fast any system could learn and beat not only humans but other systems which were as smart as it. So, what we see is today there is a mushrooming of uh, bots and computers. Uh, there is a mushrooming of bots and computers, and many of these have taken inspiration from movies. Now you all may have seen Terminator, where T eight hundred is uh, programmed to kill the villain in that who is going to destroy mankind or whatever. Now, this kind of a Terminator has actually been produced in US in 2016 and 2018 it has been modified. And this figure you see over here, six feet two uh, inches bigger, can not only walk, talk, get into a disaster zone, fight the enemy, and for a short period, it can act on its own when there is a disconnection with the master. Now, again, another uh, movie that is my generation has seen it, and that was 2001, A Space Odyssey. Some of you may not have seen that, but this was one of the very early science fiction movies. And here you had an HAL uh, 9000 computer, uh, which was supposed to aid Dave. And when Dave is trying to repair something and he wants to open the bot to come in, HAL uh, 9000 wants to take over the spaceship. And so he says, can't do that Dave. Now, this uh, is etched in my mind, this particular dialogue, and because it is very scary how computers can take over, take over the entire thing, this thing is not going to happen very soon. But a very similar thing is today available with IBM Watson. And then, you see, uh, X Machina, 
uh, there is a character called Eva. Eva is again a humanoid, and uh, humanoid has got a skin and talks and uh, reacts with people. Well, today we have Sophia here. And Sophia, in fact, is very interesting because she has done many shows. And she can, uh, you know, uh, make 60 different facial expressions. Not only that, Sophia today uh, has been recognized by, the, uh, uh, by one of the Middle East countries and is uh, their, their citizen. She is a recognized citizen over there and even WHO has honored her. So this is the first uh, bot that has been treated like a human. Similarly, you know, you have uh, today driverless cars, Johnny cabs, total recall. If you remember, there was a driverless car and then robo in Arthur, the bartender and passengers. Today, you have bartenders which are uh, robos. And uh, this, of course, fascinates this thing on the top that you see over here, Gargoyle at the Denver airport, which is entertaining all of you by carrying on a very, very intelligent and uh, continued conversation. So, a stage has come where the bots are available to be hired. So you can hire a traffic bot or a first aid bot or a math bot or a coding bot and so on, even teaching bots. So what we see today is that AI is everywhere. It's every day in use in my, uh, uh, in my small cell phone. When I make a payment, I make through AI. My email, when it tries to uh, correct, auto-correct, often to disastrous results, uh, it is again based on AI, the map that directs me, Alexa, all these are AI based. So AI is actually all encompassing. And it'll be really very surprising if AI was everywhere, but not in medicine. So, you know, after this long introduction, I'll now come to how AI is transforming medicine and uh, uh, what are the fields where AI is entering? Now, if you see in 2017, AI and IoT, that is Internet of Things, were considered two most disruptive technologies in medicine. And uh, sure enough, when we make projections and forecasts for 2021 to 2026, uh, as of 2020, we have uh, $4,490 million investments uh, in uh, AI and IoT, and it is expected to reach $34,882 million by 2026. This is a CAGR of nearly 40% over the forecast period. Which are the main players? Well, IBM Watson Health, Zebra Medical, Modernizing, Sensley, Atomwise, and they're there, there are thousands of others, actually. This is a map which, as per this projection, shows which will be the area of high and low growth. Unfortunately, the area uh, of uh, Africa comes in a projection in low growth because there is not much of penetration of AI over there. But the AI high growth areas are the entire Asia, if you see, including Australia, just beyond the Asia. And North America, surprisingly, is projected to grow only in a midway. This may be because they're already quite ahead, so they may not grow as much. So what are the fields where, uh, where uh, AI is being used in medicine? Well, we are using it in telemedicine, and telemedicine may have a great role in countries like Kenya or all of the Africa and Sahara. Then we can use it for online doctor's appointment. David had mentioned such a thing. You can use it for cloud storage of medical records. It's very easy to, uh, uh, you know, get the medical records from the cloud and it's very difficult to store them physically. And a patient may not actually go to the same clinic every time where physical records are held. So if you do cloud storage of records, which are being done already right now, retrieval is so much easier and almost anywhere the patient can get, get help. Then there are online medical resources. So if I don't know something earlier, I had to look into a book or go to a library where physically I had to see that. Today there's online medical resource everywhere. It's very easy to go and not only that, I can contact the best of the doctors anywhere in the world to help me out. Then robotic and remote surgery was mentioned. So not only can you do robotic surgery sitting on the ground, but I can do remote surgery sitting over here and the surgery can be done in Kenya. 3D printing of implants. 
Now, uh, the implants that were manufactured earlier, there was a major manufacturing process with so many, uh, you know, different systems involved and huge uh, factories. Today, you can do 3D printing of implants. It's not come up as a commercial thing in a big way right now, but it's coming up. And then there are variable monitoring systems. In fact, the simple variable monitoring system is the watch you wear when you're exercising or going for your walk to count your steps or your heart rate or pulse beat or even ECG. Now, internet of things in healthcare. Now, it's okay to have all these things, but then they must react and intervene to help out. So a variable monitoring device, such as an ECG monitor, which is fitted into a person, can sense a, uh, can sense a fibrillation, that is an uh, impending cardiac arrest or a cardiac arrest, and give a shock. This is a therapeutic intervention. Similarly, there is real-time data feedback can be given to the doctors who are sitting remotely. Reminder for taking medicines can be given to old patients or patients who are in remote areas. Virtual health assistants can transmit urine blood reports to doctors and doctor's prescriptions to pharmacists can be given directly and it can be delivered to home. So these are things where, uh, you know, life is going to be made very easy by the artificial intelligence. Of course, you've seen these pathology labs where there are gene sequencing machines. Now genes, there are, there are so many base pairs in genes that uh, if you were to do it manually, it will be almost impossible, but these gene sequencing machine make it very easy. And every day you are hearing that now a new viral mutant has come and the mutation is point A or point B or point C or whatever. Now, how do you do that? It is obviously being done by gene sequencing machines and such a large amount of data, how are they managing? Obviously through artificial, intelli artificial intelligence. Then you have biochemical analyzers with the one drop of blood, you can get so many reports and uh, similarly automated uh, blood smear analyzers. That means uh, they can see whether the blood cell is uh, defective or not, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things, I've been only talking of machines. We did not talk at all of can AI perform the task that is normally done by a clean sheet. Because all these were anyway being done by machines because you were taking samples and giving it to some machine and getting it somewhere. Most of these things are being done or being done by non-medical people like retrieving of data or storing of data. Now here, there have been major advances, especially in the field of radiology. Now in the field of radiology, you see, as I told you right in the beginning and I'll repeat it often through the lecture, that the major advantage of AI systems is that it does, is excellent at pattern recognition. Now, when you see a chest X-ray of tuberculosis, there is a pattern. And suppose if you give thousands and millions of uh, chest X-rays to a computer, it will become better than a human being. And that's what happens. So this study very clearly shows that when chest X-rays for diagnosis of tuberculosis were read by the machine, it actually gave 99% accuracy. Now, a similar thing, you know that in COVID, you can have just uh, pneumonia and pneumonia can be involving all five lobes to different degrees. Now, this has to be seen by a radiologist. As of 2015, Ghana had only 40 radiologists in the entire country. I believe about 40 million people. So, so how do you match it? That is why you need these machines. And the Chinese have actually developed, a study has shown that 4,000 patients were studied and their chest x-rays, and they were reported by the machine, that is artificial intelligence, and the same thing was also reported by five experienced radiologists. In fact, the machine outperformed all five radiologists, both in speed as well as accuracy. And now it has come nearer home to you in Nairobi. I believe you have a Kenyatta National Hospital, and while I was searching the net yesterday because I had to take this talk, I found that this is a release of 23-3-2020, where, uh, wherein uh, uh, Newsoft Medical has uh, leveraged this technology and it has introduced it into your own backyard. And uh, then, uh, you know, the initial screening is done by the machines and then it is uh, over the net, it is sent to several people in various countries in Europe and they, they counter check on it and then they give reports. Now I'll give you and run through these examples, but uh, many of you may have read a book, at least I had read it at that time in college and I was very fascinated by it, The Final Diagnosis. 
now the final diagnosis the main theme was about uh, you know knowledge over experience and uh, uh, how difficult it is to uh, to say that this particular person is suffering from cancer where it may mean either a loss of life to him or a loss of limb or a loss of particular organ or a major surgery and uh, this dilemma of the pathologist has been especially the histopathologist has been bothering them for a long time and very very experienced people also try to counter check with so many others now again this is a pattern recognition business so artificial intelligence is extremely good at it and artificial intelligence again has shown in 2016 this study shows that it is again as good if not better than most of the usual pathologists in identifying tumors it also detects lung cancer better than uh, humans and not only that after detecting the lung cancer it gives a prognosis and the prognosis is more accurate than is given by your physician dermatology in the, again dermatology these lesions that you see on your skin and especially their histopathology is extremely difficult at least in college i could never understand abc of it and uh, i am uh, not too sure whether very of the experienced pathologists also can do that except if they are working in skin now here again ai has come to the rescue now deep mind uh, again has developed a prototype product that can diagnose eye diseases now eyes are affected in hypertension diabetes macular degeneration and all these can be detected by artificial intelligence and detected as well if not better than human and indeed today a similar system has been fda approved in iowa so even fda is beginning to recognize that ai uh, is uh, something to reckon with now, there are certain very rare uh, uh, genetic disorders these genetic disorders are so rare that most people don't know about them it's so easy to pull data from various continents and then run it through the gene sequencing machine and gene sequencing machine then compares with the normal gene and you can find out where the defect lies so i showed you how in pathology and radiology ai is coming in a big way the latest thing that we are talking about is the covid 19 bug now in covid 19 in tackling covid 19 are we using ai yes we are how are we using well we are using it in crowd surveillance and temperature monitoring now uh, i don't know whether it was used or not but many of you may have seen pictures of the kumbh mela recently where thousands of devotees have uh, come together if you have a uh, if you have a device hovering around it can actually sense temperature and identify people in that or do face recognition of people who have fever and then find or track them later now this has uh, not been used here probably but it has been used early in the onset of covid in uh, usa then it can predict outbreaks by seeing patterns from where the more positivity is coming or from where the more symptoms are coming then development of vaccines now you see if you uh, you all heard that within one year so many vaccines have come out and never before this is the first time in the history of mankind that so many vaccines have come within within one year now, how did it happen because you are making mathematical models and you are through artificial intelligence you are testing them and discarding all those that will be useless and getting only a few of them and then putting them to test in a clinical setting similar thing is done in development of drugs which is a extremely expensive uh, 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 ex uh, you know uh, undertaking and uh, a lot of money goes into research and development development of drugs again it can cut costs to a large extent and we are still looking for a drug and i yesterday on whatsapp i don't believe in whatsapp Uh, news much but i saw that some drug has come up which is actually effective against covid but this i heard i think for the uh, umpteen time in the last one year now identifying and predicting mutations now new strains of covid are coming you can identify and not only that you can identify them you can predict where the next mutation is coming and also predicting future pandemics you see we knew that sars had come earlier so we did know that some pandemic is going to come because uh, these are viruses which keep on mutating and in a cyclical fashion keep on coming back so it is not that uh, we were caught off guard because we never took it seriously but the fact is that we all knew that a pandemic may come 
Now, is AI being used in management of COVID patient? Yes. See, it's a highly infectious disease. No doctor wants to get near a patient. Now, how do you do it? Online consultations is the way. Now, the traditional way was that a person presents clinically. He gives his features to the, the clinical presentation, the history, as uh, Dr. David said, to the clinician. And these, this history, then he uses on his own and gives a decision, or he goes through a rule-based algorithm from a computer and the records, and then gives some advice. Now, there is an integrative decision support system. Here, the patient may or may not go directly to the doctor. He may give directly his symptoms to the computer, and even some test results if are there. And these will again come back to the clinician, and clinician will then give the decision. Please note that we are still not at a stage where the patient goes to the computer and the computer gives a decision. We are still having an override. So how does AI fare compared to a clinician? I showed you that in some of the things it was as good or better. But how and why does it do it? Well, a clinician, what does he do? He weighs evidence to reach a conclusion. So uh, based on his experience and his knowledge. Same thing the AI also does. Only AI has much bigger knowledge base and again, a single clinician in his life may see how many patients. He may, even if he is, say, in India where there are thousands of people and he, says he has seen about a lack of a particular kind of case, it is much lesser than what an AI computer can see because it can collate data not only from India, but from China, from USA, from Europe, from, and from Africa and everywhere. Now, artificial intelligence is particularly good at association of patterns and complex algorithms. Humans are also good. We also actually see a particular kind of faces and think that this person may be suffering from X, Y, Z. But then artificial intelligence is far, far better than the humans. Machine learning uncovers complex associations because we also try to make associations in our mind and sometimes these associations we cannot really justify. We don't, it's a kind of intuition. Now, uh, the, the machine learning also does something similar, but again, using a lot of data and uh, manages it a little better than humans, uh, if I dare to say. Now, evidence de de derived from statistical methods is applied to treatment by clinicians. But at application of statistical methods and to the big data, because data is being generated as I'm talking. Now, while I'm talking, I'm obviously not reading the data that is available. While the computer is doing that simultaneously, so obviously a computer is far, far better than me in collating all the data and applying statistical methods to it. Then the most important thing is just, just like a doctor who learns from his mistake and a doctor who learns from experience, system can learn from his own experience as well as from other systems experience in an incremental manner and or in an exponential manner. So if all this can be done by the AI, then why have the doctor at all? Well, I think Dr. David did mention, where will the empathy come from? And where will the human touch come from? And can AI really think, or all AI is doing is, you know, weighing different patterns and telling you this pattern is good? Because actually AIs don't think. We don't know what happens in the black box. This brings us to another question, that we are pitting the AI against the doctor. And we want the doctor or hope that the doctor is always better than the AI, which is not always the case because a below average or an average doctor may not be better than the AI. And, and, and the top clinician in the world may be better than the AI. But how good does the AI system need to be to actually have an application in countries where the populations are large and the medical fraternity is small? Well, I think, and all of us will believe, that all it has to do is perform as well or better than the average physician. We really are not looking for a superhuman computer which will every time... I'm sorry, I think this mic is on. Please uh, please. Am I exceeding time or something? No, no, no. It's no, just no, that no. somebody's audio was on. Okay, no problem. So, uh, so basically it has to perform slightly better than or equal to an average physician and it can use, it can be used in a counter current multiplication system 
to multiply the manpower. And you can imagine, like in Kenya, you have most of your facility, you know, uh, in Nairobi. Now, what happens in the rural area, where uh, in the four levels of, uh, uh, of hospitals that you have, in level one and two, it's nurses or below, and in level three, there are nurses and some doctors and maybe a surgeon or two. And most of the specialists are concentrated in, in uh, Nairobi. So this kind of a system can screen patients from there. We are still not at a stage where we allow the screened patient to be treated. We still want a human intervention. But a, but a computer can see 200 patients in that day and just refer two of those. So it saves the time of the physician sitting in Nairobi. Now, are there some challenges uh, in uh, medical impl uh, implementation of AI? Well, there are many. Uh, firstly, it is how do you integrate into a clinical workflow? And uh, how would a clinician catch AI misdiagnosis? Like in the example that I gave, the computer has uh, seen 200 patients and it has referred only two. It may have missed one. Now, how will the clinician find that? He can't. So this is one challenge. Then there are regulatory challenges. Now, every day, the AI system is learning and learning from itself. So when it is learned from itself... Okay, I think again there is some background noise. So uh, when it is learning from uh, itself, it is learning new things and changing every day. Now, on a particular date, let's say in uh, April 2018, FDA approved a particular AI model for a particular disease. And today we are in 21. So for the last three years, this model has been learning and it may be doing different things from what it was, it was doing earlier. Has the FDA approved that? Or can the FDA every day approve a model? Or can you have a system where every morning when you come, you approve the model again? Because actually it is a renewed model. It is not the same model. Now similarly, social, social legal implications. Now suppose something goes wrong, who's responsible? The person who made the software, the person who made the hardware, the, the firm which was marketing it, or the doctor who was sitting remotely. Now these are challenges which are difficult to address as of now. And a very important thing is that in the black box that I said, that is the neuronal layers, we don't know what the hell is going on inside. Uh, we just don't know. We know there's an input layer and there's an output layer. So if something goes wrong, we don't know how to address that because we didn't know in the first place how the computer did it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a saying from Kane Upanishad is very apt. Of course, that is uh, said about God, but the same thing I can say about black box. It says that, Yasya matam tasya matam matam yasya navedasaha avvigyatam vijanatam vigyatam vijanatam. That is, to whomsoever it is unknown, whosoever does not know it, to him it is known, he knows it. To whomsoever it is known, he does not know. And it is unknown to those who know it and known to those who do not know. Now there is another major limitation and that is, you see we all know and we've all experienced that when we are trying to use a simple computer and trying to, uh, you know, wanting it to do something, it doesn't always do what we want it to do. It only does what we tell it to do. Now, in a bigger scale, when you have an artificial intelligence which does things on its own, we feed it with data and mountains of data. Now, this data, the output from the other end is only as good the data we have fed in. And there may be fallacies in the data because I told you computer or this machine in AI is not objective. It is just learning, correlation and patterns. It is not going by the causation. So if you are giving wrong data, you will get wrong results. And how will you be giving wrong data? Now let's take an example. Let's say that I discover a new drug which is excellent for lung cancer and cures lung cancer in about 70% of the people, which is not possible today. So now this is so expensive that only few people in China, USA and Hong Kong could be using it. And uh, when the data comes out, we find that there is no data from Africa because nobody used it in Africa. So in this, the computer can make an assumption 
that this is effective in China, Hong Kong, and USA, and not effective in, uh, in Africa. And such a thing is very much possible because you will uh, appreciate the fact that AI systems and computers we are having in the developed world. And the data is being collected from the developed world in their circumstances and in their kind of background. Now, what happens uh, to the data which is being missed out altogether and not being collected from India, from Ghana, from Kenya, and so on. So, uh, this is something that we have to address. And here is a cartoon which shows you that uh, this is your machine learning system. He says, yeah, you pour the data into this big pile of linear averager, then collect the answers from the other side. He says, yes. What if the answers are wrong? He really doesn't know. He says, just start the pile again and start looking again. So you just change your data and start looking again if the answers are coming wrong. But despite these limitations, uh, there is a lot of hype and people do believe uh, that AI will come in a big way. That I told you right in the beginning of the talk. And Vinod Khosla of Micro, Sun Microsystem is a venture capitalist. He believes that medicine today is better than any time before. And this is primarily because today we are able to collect much more data. We are able to know the patient's blood pressure, the patient's uh, heart rate, ECG, and 60 other parameters through a simple blood test. And with that, we know what is wrong with the patient better than what we knew before. He believes that there are total 3,000 odd processes in the body. And if all these 3,000 processes could be monitored, we would be intervening much earlier in a disease. So he believes that uh, as we progress, we'll be able to monitor and measure more and provide better care. This is a disruptive technology. And according to him or his belief, 80% of the physicians would lose their job to AI. And who will be the first to go? First to go will be the non-human interface jobs. Now, if we go by this example, it, would it be the pathologist and the radiologist? Well, we don't know. And of course, in record keeping, then skill-based applications are coming, robotics and robotic surgery, both remote and actual over there. But then the job that will remain is that those skill-based uh, robotics may not be better than humans as of now. And uh, empathy and emotion-related jobs will remain. So if we see the, the way things have gone around, especially from 2010 onwards, and the computational ability and big data has increased, change is inevitable. Change will come. But who will bring this change? Will it be the medical fraternity? Or will it be the IT sector or the industry? For this, we have to reflect. Who has the incentive for disruption? Walmart didn't change retail. Amazon did. General Motors didn't change electric cars. Didn't change to electric cars. Tesla did. NBC and BBC didn't change the media. Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp did. So it's not going to be us doctors who are going to bring the change. We are the threatened species here. It has to be coming from the non-doctors, from the industry, because they have the maximum incentive. Who benefits from this? Well, AI developers, they certainly benefit because they may profit from big and profitable market in healthcare. Healthcare providers can improve efficiency, so they will benefit. So if I've got a big hospital, I can improve efficiency and uh, I'm good. Payers, yes, payers, those who are paying for it, the insurance companies and all, uh, and wasted misdiagnosis, they will all be benefiting. And pharma, they will be identifying novel treatments and strategies and drugs, and they will be benefiting. But in all these people who are benefiting, aren't we forgetting the patient? Because any AI that comes, the basic point remains that the patient must benefit. So we should, whenever we are trying to develop a new technology or bring in a new technology, let's not look at the top four beneficiaries. Let, let's focus on the patient. Now, healthcare and AI global initiatives. I'm almost at the end of the talk. I may have exceeded the time, so I'll just quickly finish from here. So, uh, as I said, the uh, IBM Watson is using uh, diabetic, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy and to analyze process and medical reports. These are two things where it is working. Then Google DeepMind is working in mammograph, acute kidney injury, and retinal scans. And then tools are being developed to diagnose rare diseases, 
xenon generalized to personalized medicine. Now, personalized medicine is another thing. We all know that we all react to medicines differently. Now, what xenon is doing is it is going to our genomics and seeing which medicine will will uh, uh, do better in a particular kind of uh, race or uh, gene complex. Atomwise is, anal is analyzing molecules and predicting their efficacy, side effects, and toxicity in humans. And precision medicine initiative by NIH called All of Us is trying to seek and build a national research, a research cohort and repository of 1 million or more uh, case records. Chinese have made major strides and uh, they have smart healthcare strategy, especially because they have an aging population. And this aging population will require a lot of doctors which they don't have or which nobody has you know, uh, to provide at rural areas. So they are making smart healthcare technologies for this. They are collaborating in research, exchange and cooperation of AI for healthcare programs with several countries in the Road and Belt Initiative. Then they have got AI-based medical tools uh, that have been approved by their regulatory, regulatory authority. You see, regulatory authorities are very scared in approving any AI-based tool. So somebody has to take a leap because they're not really bad. And they will be helpful. China is doing that. Then there was a televised program where uh, an artificial intelligent doctor, BioMind, uh, was pitched against a neurophysician in diagnosis and prediction of expansion of hematoma in a televised program. Now, hematoma, when it occurs in the brain, how quickly it expands and what will be the effect of it. Uh, and uh, I dare say that BioMind was far, far better than the, in the, in the prediction than the neurophysicians. They have another program called iFlyTech. Now, iFlyTech was pitted against the humans who are taking the licentiate exam. And uh, it outperformed 96% of the humans which were taking the exam. So AI definitely are not worse doctors than the average doctor. They're as good or equal. Well, India has quite similar problems as uh, most of Africa, which is shortage of healthcare workers. Healthcare facilities are not available uniformly. Less than 2% of the hospitals are accredited. And uh, most of them are in larger cities. Then government health infrastructure is low. 62.4% of the health expenditure comes out of pocket of the individual. So seeing all this, there has been a major focus of the Niti Aayog in India on development of AI in all fields, including medicine. And uh, indeed, it can be seen in a lot of startups uh, in, uh, in and around Bangalore and Hyderabad. Uh, like Edwin is, is doing tissue engineering, then there is another company uh, doing diabetic retinopathy, TB and breast cancer diagnostics. Then diagnostic from imaging is being by, done by Chiron X. Live Health is doing online reporting. Liberate is doing online consultation. Neurosynaptics is doing remote healthcare delivery. And uh, then the breast cancer early detection programs are being developed. Proteonomics and genomics is being developed by OncoStem Diagnostics. And Unidoc mm -hmm. is doing appoint appointments and patient records. Another company is doing diagnostic X-ray, MRI, and CTs. And then blood and urine microscopies and X-rays. So these are the fields where startups are already, uh, already there present in India. And they are expected to, uh, to uh, contribute majorly in uh, the near future. Now, if you see. Uh, what are the problems, uh, let's say, in your country? It's similar, remote rural areas, paucity of trained staff at level one, two, three, healthcare facilities, shortage of trained specialists outside capital cities, and affordability. Affor affordability is a major factor here. So AI-based diagnostic facility can be used for screening. And uh, uh, though there is some talk of it, I don't really know that uh, a lot of many facilities have come up in Kenya. Uh, telemedicine penetration of cell phones is very high. So telemedicine can be used very effectively because I think the uh, penetration of cell phones in your country is around 90%. Then AI-based cervical cancer detection program is actually already in place. How successful it is, I don't know, but it is already in place. And uh, these tissues are uh, uh, sent, <coughs> sent to Europe and you get uh, diagnosis from there. But scope for expansion exists. So we come to the last part of the talk. Now that we know that AI can perform equal to, if not better than doctors, will doctors be needed in future? This is a question that not only doctors, even all the non-doctors also uh, have wondered about. 
the answer to this is that no but certainly doctors who use artificial intelligence will will replace those doctors who choose not to use artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence as of now with the current level of knowledge and development can be used as best as a tool and not as an override on the human and i will show it to you by various examples like robotic surgery and heart surgery so there are several examples and advantages of robotic surgery like it gives a small scar short hospital span lower risk etc etc but then when a study was conducted it was found that actually it gave no benefit over a traditional physician but all these are claimed by the industry actually when you see there is no real benefit when you do a formal study not only that there is one particular inst uh, instance in 2018 when the robotic arm was doing the surgery and the patient died on the table because the robo went berserk it's a machine after all as i told you it doesn't think it works on patterns it is not thinking it is not evil as it is shown in the movies it is just that it goes berserk it malfunctions and so the patient died there are other examples from other industries you talk of the boeing 737 max 8 two fatal accidents the lion air crash and the ethiopian airline crash in both so many people died and why did they die because it had a system where the the nose down was being corrected on its own to to prevent stall and this could not be overridden or understood by the human pilot over there the system was not there and so whenever the aircraft sensed that it is going to stall it put the nose down and nose down to the extent that the patient the, that the plane crashed of course now these planes are coming back after uh, correction of the fault that was there but see the cost that we have paid because of a because we were relying on ai too much now here is another example how humans can help <laughs> you've all heard of the miracle on hudson where sully when he had a uh, bird hit in both engines and both engines uh, at take off only stopped functioning he decided to land on the hudson river i can assure you that no ai system however advanced it is and however big data it has is going to make this decision to land the aircraft on water and save lives similar thing it happened again repeat 15th august 2019 when damir yusupov his aircraft lost all power and where did he land in the corn field and did all the people die no all of them survived so you see this is a stage where if you totally depend on uh, computers you are not likely to retrieve these unusual situations because unusual situations require unusual reactions and that the computer is not going to do so to summarize many medical ai applications are on the horizon but you have to be aware of over inflated claims so we do expect progress but we have to be cautious that we don't over inflate our claims and projections machine learning models are as good as the training data and that is where the problem is so we have to make sure that the training data is not biased if we enter biased data we'll get biased results and many socio economical and legal challenges are ahead that is man machine fight that goes on and whether you know machine can override man or man should always override the uh, machine so this require an open discussion and broad range of stakeholders need to discuss it together and then come to a decision to a conclusion uh thank you very much uh i have said what i had to say if there are any questions i'd be happy to answer thank you and uh, uh just uh, how do i get all the uh, all the audience on my screen i had removed them earlier can somebody guide me with that yes uh here we are yeah i got them. wonderful thank you thank you very much indeed uh major general dr ravi for this very enriching uh experience which you have given us as your audience it's it's been a very enriching experience listening to this wonderful well presented talk and thank you for this very educational uh thought provoking presentation so whilst um i request all the rotarians and guests to kindly inbox their questions uh i'll request um, rotarian uh Joe Muganda to kindly give a vote of thanks to our honorable speaker today. Okay, um on behalf of the Nairobi Rotary uh 
club, um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Major General Dr. Ravi, for a wonderful um, discussion. I like Jeff, Jeffrey uh, Bamford, when I heard what the topic was and having worked in an industry that was severely disrupted by um, technology, I said, I've got to listen to this. Um, you've presented the challenges. Um, it's interesting where you started. I remember Gaspar of losing to the, to the computer, talking about Go, and then talking about movies. I never thought we would be talking about movies today. Mm -hmm. Telling us what the benefits of um, deep learning are and what um, the advantages are, and then are concluding with the challenges and showing us that um, while the AI is great, there are unusual situations where human beings um, have to be present to react uh, differently um, from the way a computer would. So it has been an interesting one. I've seen some of the questions. They are dominate really the back part of your discussion about legality, responsibility. So I think um, we are waiting to hear what those answers will be or your personal views. But thank you very much for raising the issue. Um, and it's been an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Rotary and Joe, for that uh, vote of thanks for a wonderful guest speaker today. I will now um, request our president-elect uh, Gideon Akwabi to kindly uh, present his question to our guest speaker, followed by Dr. Michael Hopkins. Okay, President Ritesh, let me just... Just read through my question. Uh, yes, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Ravi, Ravi you, can... you have indicated the ethical and legal challenges on who to hold to account when AI malfunctions. Guess no, that, that, that also becomes an issue. Yes. Uh, morally, on how far we can go in using AI in getting to use it, and more so for harmful adventures like creating human beings using this technology. Yes. Uh, from my chemistry class, I note humans whose matter consists of carbon is mimicked by a computer that is mostly silicon. Yes. <laughs> the computer has already beaten our greatest grandmaster in chess. Can we find these two items that are the same group of periodic table random walk? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting observation. I really have uh, no answer to that, but definitely a very, very interesting comment. Right. Uh, next, we have uh, sorry, uh, President-elect Gideon. Did you have a follow-up? No, no, no. Just thanking Ravi for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much, President Ritter. Thank you, uh, Dr. Michael Hopkins. Uh, would you like to kindly raise your question? Thank you very much, uh, and uh, congratulations to Major General Ravi for uh, a superb speech. Uh, I think we all learned something from your from your speech today. Um, this issue of artificial intelligence, of course, has been around for well, 50, 60 years, maybe even even longer. Um, my question is essentially um, uh, the worry that I have these days of, of interference of malevolent malevolent countries who could interfere with um, AI software and kill all patients. Now this seems rather outlandish and we hope it never happens, but unfortunately, and we know many countries have this IT facility and many are malevolent these days. We don't have to mention many, uh, Myanmar for example is, is the latest on the list of rather ruthless and nasty, nasty countries and they seem to be growing. And then also uh, other countries uh, have the, the possibility of creating havoc by error. And we've seen that happen as well. Um, I mean, how much was the recent uh, uh, nuclear attack allegedly by Israel on Iran an error? It wasn't the most best of timing. So these things happen. Now, uh, certainly some of the bigger things that, that do happen, they continue. Uh, we know, for example, the US uh, presidential election was totally affected by um, I wouldn't say artificial intelligence, but intelligence from some place. Um, so what worries me about um, uh, AI, and certainly not against the use of it, but how can we control it? How can we stop 
sort of ma malevolence getting in, some nasty country deciding to put something in there that everybody accepts and starts to use it, and it kills lots of them. What, what thoughts have you got on that? Thank you. Oh, well, it's a very, very relevant question. But hasn't almost every advance that we've had has uh, some sort of a malevolent reaction? It means we built automobiles, but we also built tanks. We built aircrafts, and then we built fighter aircrafts to drop bombs. So this will happen. And uh, we will have to put in safeguards. Fortunately for us, except for a country like China, uh, and that is my personal view, uh, you know, because that country is a little obscure it's behind the curtain and you don't know what exactly is going on. Uh, the, all the rest of the countries that you mentioned, uh, because of the way they are going, they are not advancing that fast in AI. And they'll be using technologies which are developed by you and me in some other part of the world. And uh, we could possibly take into account what you're saying and put in some sort of a safeguard that with a push of a button, uh, when required, we can make all of them ineffective. I mean, that's just a thought which comes offhand. But the point you've raised is uh, definitely very, very relevant. But if we were scared of uh, malevolence getting in, because it will sometime, somewhere in the world, we would probably not make progress. So progress we have to make and continue to discuss how we'll deal with it when it happens. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do you have any follow up question, uh, Professor Michael Hopkins? I, I think just that I hope that uh, when the time comes, Major General Ravi will be head of all this and looking at all these <laughs> malevolent inf influences because we certainly need somebody like him. Thank you very much. I, I learned a lot today. Lovely having you here. Thank you. And with that, um, do we have any further questions? We have two comments. Uh, Past District Governor Jeffrey Bamford is uh, grateful for the wonderful presentation, and uh, as is Dr. David Kitanga and uh, all the members of Rotary Club of Nairobi as well. Uh, yes, Vice President, uh, Ambassador Dr. Josephine. Yes, good afternoon. I'll have a Fred. quick comment later. Ah, Mike. President Mike, yes. Why doesn't Mike go first? I'll speak after Mike. Okay, uh, my, my comment is, is, um, is, is not a, a question at all, but it's a reflection that right now with COVID in hospital myself, I am trying to generate as much different types of intelligence as I can to keep my mental well-being and my positive outlook where it needs to be. And it's like I've got some implant of new types of intelligences that have been forced to be generated to keep me going. Happily, and I just want to share this with my fellow Rotarians, it's a better day today, and I just want to let you know that. And thanks, Josephine, for letting me push in. And let me hand back to you guys now. Be strong and get well soon. Thank you very much, Mike. It's always lovely to see you looking as you are, making progress. And of course, health is a it's a state of well-being that does include mental health. So to hear that you feel that um, mentally you're engaging and developing even new, by the way, neurological pathways, neuron pathways is very important. Actually, the best patient is one who thinks ahead of his doctor, thinks about the response of his nurse, and is able to psychologically manage the care that they give him or her. So. Thank you very much for bringing this to the table. And it's so in tune with what I was going to say. I just wanted to share with Dr. Ravi something that I saw on the social media this week from Rwanda, the use of robotics in the management of COVID-19. And the fact that physicians there are saying 
that they are happy that they have robots, robots to support the caregiving role that they should undertake. Of course, it's generic. It's taking vital signs, it's giving medicines, and it's interfacing with the patient. That doesn't absolve or take away the role of the physician. The physicians are still going to the bedside, but they're going less. In this manner, the physicians are managing their own mental health and stress levels. They're managing their own infection control. They are therefore reducing what we call nosocomial infections because they're less, the contact is reduced. So they're also protecting the patient. Mike will let us know if he would feel comfortable with the robot coming in. He's probably going to say that some of the people giving him care are already very robotic. But uh, Rwanda is actually now looking towards reducing um, infection rates based on uh, caregiving in this mode. I thought I'd just comment on that. And Mike, uh, great to see you. Lots of greetings from the London team and from us all. Back to you, Dr. Ravi and President Ritesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that information. I did not know that Rwanda was already using uh, robots and COVID management in this way, and I didn't even mention it in my talk. Thank you. That's very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, past president Mike, we are sending you healing energies and uh, we are delighted to, to hear you uh, today and uh, as usual uh, and also to see you smile. So thank you so much. Dr. Margareta, uh, would you like to say hello? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually in the hospital myself. I'm waiting for a certain x-ray, but uh, when I had opportunities, I was listening to this really fascinating talk, and I, I was uh, amused that Dr. Ravi had to refer to um, cinema, uh, Terminator, which I haven't seen, but <laughs> some of these dire movies of AI, and I uh, share uh, Dr. Hopkins' concern about um, my goodness, them getting the data and adding data and going on track to, well, why couldn't they take over the world? That's the question I would ask. <laughs> Is that possible? Anyway, it's lovely to be here today. And um, Dr. Ravi, can, I, can AI robots take over the world? <laughs> my question. <laughs> uh, I think it still remains as a fiction. In fact, when we talk of AI, we talk of levels of AI. And uh, in uh, levels of AI, uh, uh, you know, various people have described uh, variously, but uh, most people say it is one to three, but some people have said one to seven. But when you talk of one to seven, at level one, it is just machine learning, and uh, at level three, some amount of cognition comes in. But uh, the ability to do things with purpose uh, as humans do, or be deceitful deliberately, that would come at level five, and none of the computers today are anywhere close to that. So, uh, so I don't think computers on their own or robots on their own will be able to take over the world. However, <laughs> if uh, somebody who controls the computers or the robots has malintention, I'm sure that he would be able to use them and cause some harm. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, not very settling. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, uh, Major General Dr. Ravi, we are truly honored and grateful for this wonderful presentation. And we are truly, truly grateful, uh, Rotarian Rashmi. Uh, for uh, having such a brilliant pre uh, presentation and such a wonderful uh, honorable guest speaker for us today. Thank you, thank you so much. And for those who have missed out on this talk, um, it will be uploaded onto YouTube and the link will be shared with uh, the club members and at large. So thank you, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank, you. In closing, thank you, in closing, I'd like to 
kindly uh, uh, if we can all raise a toast to all who attended today, to our uh, guests and uh, visiting Rotarians, uh, to Rotary the world over. Rotary the world over. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>